Hello there, my fellow House Davian supporters, and welcome back to some more Battletech lore. Today we shall add another entry into our series on Battletech battle armor design. This time we shall learn a couple of things about several unique Federated Sons models, namely the Cavalier, the Fusilier, and the more unusual looking Sloth. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Let us begin today's episode with the Cavalier, massing at 1 ton and costing 400,000 sea bills. In the wake of the clan invasion of the Inner Sphere, the AFFC High Command moved to capitalize on the resulting technological boom. The entire series of battle mechs and vehicle designs debuted in those years, as did not only the very first Inner Sphere produced battle armor suit, but also another three unique suits designed by the Federated Commonwealth engineers and built by Federated Commonwealth companies. By the end of the decade, however, the secession of the Lyran Alliance would send morale plummeting throughout the entire realm. In an effort of rebuild military morale within the sundered AFFC, Victor Steiner Davion spearheaded the redesign for Davion Pride project, which would see mechs like the Enforcer and the Jaeger mech significantly upgraded. In the same vein, High Command also pushed through the redesign of the standard Inner Sphere battlesuit that its armored infantry troops had been fighting in for the better part of a decade. Upon completion, the new suit was nicknamed the Cavalier. What began as a purely cosmetic change would become much more significant, as the designers kept working on the suit's image. Give and take between aesthetics and combat worthiness required the computer simulations of hundreds of designs, and dozens of prototypes. Once an acceptable look was achieved, there were some unexpected results too. Armor plating shifted around the suit, enhancing leg armor by enlarging the plating over the calves and thighs, but on the other hand the arms and hands lost significant armor protection. Some within the AFFC were concerned that these changes were becoming too severe, compromising the complicated armor's most basic function, and that was protecting the wearer from harm. But, rather than incurring the significant time and cost involved in returning to the drawing board, engineers pressed on with what they had. Although the suit's exposed elbow and hand joints resulted in vulnerability to shrapnel, the wearer did enjoy an increased level of manual dexterity compared to the standard model. Reluctantly, the officers assigned to the project concluded that the benefits outweighed the drawbacks. The AFFC had achieved in just a few months their goal of a unique battle armor for the Federated Commonwealth, which quickly boosted morale in the units that received them to replace standard battle armor lost in combat. Ever since its introduction, the Cavalier has seen few changes. To date there had been more Cavaliers built in the Inner Sphere than any other battle armor suit, outside of the generically named Inner Sphere Standard. However, there was also the highest percentage of losses among the Cavalier, mostly because of the Fedcom Civil War, which regularly pitted the Cavalier against itself and the many other battle armor designs also fielded by the Federated Sons and the Lyran Nations. Throughout the war, the Cavalier consistently outperformed almost any other Inner Sphere battlesuit it was pitted against, outside of the Infiltrator Mark II. Nowadays, the Cavalier is in service with every single AFFS RCT or Regimental Combat Team, along with many Lyran RCTs, and the unit likewise complements scores of conventional mechanized and jump infantry units too. Independent battle armor battalions had proven decisive on many occasions throughout the Fedcom Civil War and during the Jihad. The forces of the Word of Blake and even commanders of the Combine and the Capellans are feeling firsthand the pressure these hardy battlesuits can place on them, regardless of whether they field their own battle armor or not. Equipment-wise, the Cavalier has a modular weapon mount in the right arm and a battle claw in the left arm. The mount can carry one standard battle armor weapon like a flamer, small laser, machine gun, or an SRM-1 with four missiles. The weapon mount can also accept two secondary weapons like laser rifles or needler rifles for use against infantry. 
the armor can jump up to 90 meters, and it is just as strong as the standard. It is also protected by the same 450 kilograms of armor, or 992 pounds. The second of today's designs is the Fusilier, and it is also the heaviest at 2 tons. Unfortunately, the Fusilier is a prime example of the military spending a lot of effort on something unnecessary, as the end product did not meet a lot of demand. Introduced in the early 3120s, this thing was too heavy and too slow, but the AFFS wanted it anyway. General Motors produced it for little more than a decade before finding an attractive upgrade option, but the Fusilier did remain an odd duck in the AFFS battle armor battalions. As a heavy combat suit, the Fusilier was intended to stand in the line of battle with other prominent AFFS battle suits like the Grenadier and the Hauberk. But where those designs have distinguishing characteristics, the Fusilier has none. It is a bastardized weapon, incorporating parts of the Grenadier and the Sea Fox, but the construction is solid and its performance, while not flashy, is solid as well. Its upgrade, deployed after the blackout, trades the jump booster and mag shot for a plasma rifle and reflective armor. Once upon a time, a company of Fusiliers was on the world of Demeter training with the planetary militia, when the warrior house Ijori and a third Tycan of Gods attacked in 3144. Although the militia survived the initial assault and went to ground, the Fusiliers were too heavy and too slow to be useful in a guerrilla war, and so they remained behind to protect the militia base at Dormant. Soon, a task group from the Tycan of Gods arrived and demanded the fort surrender. Hoping to give the militia more time to escape and establish wilderness strongpoints, one Captain Edgar Provenance refused. Led by a couple of Gun Omnimax and supported by two companies of infantry, the Capellans attacked. The batteries of the fort succeeded in destroying all three of the supporting Predator tank destroyers before they could get closer, but the Guns were too fast and slipped over the fort walls. One of them destroyed the turrets from behind, while the other stalked the infantry inside the fort walls. The men of Captain Provenance had spent their time wisely though, and they were ready. Attacking out of cover, one platoon of fusiliers slaughtered almost a full company of Liao infantry as they were entering the fort. The other two platoons played cat and mouse with House Liao Max, firing their mag shots but doing little damage. A lucky hit took out the PPC of one of the goons, but it had already killed more than a squad of troopers by that point. The arrival of the rest of the infantry and Liao Vitals would seal the fate of the Fusiliers, but still they did their job. The militia's insurgency built a sound foundation during the lull. Older model Fusiliers were often preferred by Capellan March militia units because of the resilience of their stealth armor over the fragile reflective armor. As proven by a raid conducted by a detachment on New Sirtis in 3139. Striking at the training site on Nihal, the CMM detachments, two squads of fusiliers riding captured Capellan Shan transport vetoes, was composed of half advanced and half original suits. When the team came under fire while hiding in a building, the advanced fusilier battle suits crumpled beneath falling building spars and damage suffered in the building collapse. The second squad, with less advanced but sturdier armor, was able to accomplish the mission and escape. Equipment-wise, the Fusilier mounted two weapon systems, a magshot gauss rifle with 10 rounds of ammo in the right arm and a light machine gun in the body. An armored glove was installed on the left arm. The third and final battle armor for today is the Sloth, weighing at 1.5 tons, and costing 450,000 sea bills. The Sloth was in fact one of the first generation of battle armor designs developed in the Inner Sphere, based on data stolen from the clans by the first Somerset Strikers during the early days of Operation Revival. Using the stolen data, the Federated Commonwealth immediately began development of two different designs, one of which was a scout suit, the Infiltrator, and the second being this one. For this second design, a team at the New Avalon Institute of Science, consisting mostly of Lyran nationals, 
set to work on a heavily armored and well-armed suit that could stand and fight against any other battle armor. But rather than attempting to copy the humanoid elemental suit that was so effective with the clans, they chose to create a quadruped design that could serve as a mobile weapon platform. The reasons behind this unusual decision were several fold. With its lower profile and four-legged base, the Slav would provide a strong, stable platform to better mount more impressive weapons. The quadruped design also had fewer technical challenges than a humanoid one, sharing more in common with the traditional battle mechs and combat vehicles, speeding up the development process and making it easier to train new pilots. The first prototype of the officially titled SLHX Sloth was deployed by the first Somerset Strikers at Waldorf 5 during an initial live fire testing alongside the infiltrator. Its very first pilot was one Franklin Sakamoto, who unofficially was the illegitimate son of Jokonis Combine coordinator Theodore Kurita. When the Clan Jade Falcon launched a surprise attack during the test, Franklin also became the first Inner Sphere pilot to destroy an enemy mech in combat with battle armor, using the mine launcher of the Sloth to take down a Mad Dog. Based on the combat performance, the Commonwealth approved the Slav for production in 3050, debiting at the same time as the Infiltrator. While the Slav did serve well for its time and represented a major step in native Inner Sphere battle armor deployment, it did suffer from flaws inherent in the design. While deployed throughout the Twin Realms, Federated Sun's High Command was never that impressed by the Slav, resulting in production shifting to the Lyran half. When the Fedcom Civil War ended, the Lyrans would continue building the Sloth in limited numbers until its replacement, the Fenrir, came out in 3060. Afterwards, all production on the Sloth would stop, although surviving examples would continue to be used by many units, including mercenaries, for many more years. Equipment-wise, in its role as a mobile weapons platform, the Sloth carries two small lasers giving it good damage potential and staying power. These are located in fixed forward mounts on the suit, which can hit any target within a 90 degree arc. To supplement the lasers, it also mounts a pop-up mine launcher that can attach a powerful explosive onto unsuspecting enemies. Equivalent to two short-range missiles, this thing does suffer from a very short range though. The Slav carries only 250 kilograms of armor, or 550 pounds still enough to get hit by a medium laser and keep the pilot alive. Its low profile does make it more difficult to be targeted than humanoid suits. However, a major drawback in the sloth is the lack of any manipulators or claws. This prevents the suit from picking up things, from riding into battle on omni handholds, or performing anti-mech attacks. The sloth interdictor model came out in 3075. Designers refitting the Slav by removing the pop-up mine and small lasers and replacing them with an ECM suite and a pair of ER small lasers. Finally, the Slav Huntsman is a Dark Age variant, carrying two King David light Gauss rifles, and also equipped with a battle armor mechanical jump booster. It is protected by improved stealth armor as well. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these Davion battle armor designs, the Fusilier, the Sloth, and the Cavalier for today. Just like with the Draconis Combine, these are not the only Federated Suns designs, and I will return to cover at least three more in the future. What about you? What are your thoughts on these particular variants? Did you ever see them or use them in your own games? Are they among your favorite battle armor designs? Do share any thoughts or questions or extra knowledge you may have in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and have a healthy day. GDN signing out.